Melissa or Mel Falkenberg and I'm the Manager of City Transport at Wyndham City. I'm also a proud member of the MTF Executive and I'm joining you from the land of the Bunurong people. Before I introduce our next speakers, just a quick reminder to use the uh, chat function for general discussion and use the Q&A if you'd like to post a question. And again, we'll check in with Jane um, following the presentation to go through the questions. Next up, we have two great speakers, Juan Carbonell and Hayden Matthews. Juan leads the Asia Pacific Territory for Move It, the world's largest urban mobility platform with over 1 billion users over, over 12 countries. He believes that the future of transport is getting closer to your customer through a deeper understanding of their needs and behaviours. With advances in mobility as a service and mobile phone technology, Juan says we're closer than ever to creating urban areas where shared, convenient and accessible mobility will be available for everyone. It's a future that he actively is working towards bringing forward. Juan's career spans 18 years through a range of disciplines, 12, 12 of those in the transport industry. Over the past six years, he's designed and delivered complex projects for government and private businesses across the region. Prior to joining MoveIt, Juan was the Managing Director of Grouch Match, which is an Uber company, and directed a program for West Connects. He also delivered the largest demand responsive transport service in the Southern Hemisphere with Transport for New South Wales, which is over 1,300 vehicles. Hayden Matthews leads network planning for the Ventura Group, Victoria's oldest and largest family-owned public transport company founded in 1924. Ventura operate over 900 buses from 12 locations within Victoria and employ over 1,500 staff. Ventura have fast become a leading bus company in performance, customer satisfaction and technology by pushing ideals of innovation, continuous improvement and change management. Hayden has worked in the public transport industry for 10 years. For the four years prior to his current role, he was responsible for the operational management of Ventura's head office site in Dandenong. The site operates a mixture of public transport services, including metro buses, B-line regional coaches, specialist needs school services, town shuttle services, to name a few. As the planning manager, Hayden's overseen the successful planning and implementation of Ventura's second DRT zone, the train timetable re-coordination in April 2021, resulting in the rescheduling of 70% of Ventura's network and the refinement of customer experience and profitable service level for the first DRT zone in Roeville. Welcome, Juan and Hayden. Over to you. Thank you so much, Melissa, and thank you for the warm welcome. And everyone, thank you so much also for your time today. Uh, we have uh, much, uh, many exciting topics to kind of share with you today, particularly focused on demand responsive transport. And you may be asking, what is DRT? Why is this relevant for me? And of course, my, my local um, council. And hopefully by the end of today's conversation, we'll help uh, address and, and tackle some of those questions and get you excited about the kind of future of uh, more localized mobility through demand responsive transport. Uh, so Melissa quickly mentioned, you're probably thinking who's Move It, what do they do? Um, and we are the maker of uh, the world's uh, number one urban mobility platform with 1.1 billion users in 112 countries uh, with over 350 integrations. Uh, so you name it, your Ubers, your Olas, your Birds, your Beams, you know, e-mobility, um, all the way through to cabs and taxis, having that all in one place to plan your journey. And then of course for us, DRT is an extension of that and pulling it all together into your one journey plan and mixing it all in. So as we quickly jump into, you know, what is on-demand transport? What is demand-responsive transport? Uh, you know, on, I, I always think of the dichotomy between a bus on the left-hand side, as you can see here, which is a, a static schedule, a static route, larger vehicles, they move high volumes of people towards a taxi, as we all know, is a very, you know, a private vehicle, typically just one person in that vehicle going to a specific location through a dynamic route. And where DRT sits is kind of in the middle of both of those where, um, you know, you have dynamic routes where your routes are changing based on where people are requesting trips to happen from and you're dropping them off typically around key locations around that city and not to any potential timetable. It's when you need it. Typically, it's on demand, like at that particular moment or in some period of uh, in the future, like 20 or 30 minutes and uh, in the, into the future. And from there, of course, that route is dynamic, but you're still moving and grouping and aggregating as many people into that vehicle as possible. So DRT kind of sits in the middle of those two uh, extremes. And why? Why is it important for us? Why is it even relevant? And there's kind of three views of the world, you know, for the operator. It's, you know, looking at increasing earnings, moving more people in those vehicles, keeping them less empty, 
hopefully driving less kilometers per day. And that's something that Hayden's going to chat about a lot today is, you know, how we've worked on that together and, and, you know, worked on lowering number of KMs on these existing contracts and picking up and moving more people during that period of time. You know, for the rider, I think it's, it's obvious those benefits are almost more like Uber-like or, or, or you know, taxi-like, where there's more comfortable rides, fewer passengers, shorter wait times, minimal route deviation, you're getting straight to where you want to go. And then ultimately for cities, you know, looking at the, the larger, the macro view of things, it's reducing congestion, it's reducing air pollution, and it's getting people to where they need to go quicker. So they're spending more time with their loved ones. They're doing the things they're passionate about more than sitting there waiting in traffic and just checking their phone for an hour, um, you know, because that train trip or that bus trip might be stuck in traffic, et cetera. So um, with that, I'll hand over now to Hayden to share more on the actual projects. Great. Thank you very much, Juan. And thank you, Melissa. It's, it's very exciting to be here today to talk about the achievements that Venture have made thus far with DRT. And, and as Juan said, in partnership with Move It has made all of this possible. So I wanted to talk about, and um, Juan, if you're able to continue sharing your screen, I think it dropped down. There we go. Um, I'm going to try and keep this as brief as possible. I, I unfortunately have the, um, uh, the bad habit of, of running over time. So um, if we could go to the next slide, Juan, I'll introduce the, the service areas that Ventura are currently running. So the two zones that Ventura currently have running are in Roeville, which is in the eastern suburbs, and Lilydale, which is in also the eastern suburbs. The... Roeville zone has been running since December 2020 and the Lilydale zones went live on the 4th of October this year, so two weeks ago. There are some key differences between the two zones. Um, the two maps that are in front of you today are an overlay of the existing routes, uh, the Tallybus routes and the 676 route in Lilydale, with the visual service areas of uh, the FlexiRide DRT service. The reason that we want to show you these maps is to give you a uh, insight into the gains that are had through expanding the service area through DRT and how that captures um, many more uh, residents than what a traditional fixed route were. The differences between these two projects uh, is they converted seven tally bus routes. So those of you who don't know what a telebus route is, it was implemented by Invicta bus lines back in the 70s or 80s, where a bus would perform a fixed route and um, would deviate to your home if you booked it by, uh, by phone. It would deviate to your home so long as you were in the service area. The conversion of that to DRT um, increased the, the service area available to customers, as well as the transition of the 676 fixed route service into the DRT service area as well. How the DRT service works is it, it operates off a curved hub model. So in the Roeville zone, we have Fentry Valley Railway Station and Stud Park Shopping Centre as the two hubs. Um, in the Lilydale zone, it, it's, it's much, much larger. It's three times the size of the Roeville zone. So in Lilydale Township, we have Lilydale Railway Station and Lilydale Shopping Precinct in the Main Street. We then have Chenside Park Shopping Centre, uh, as well as Moorbark Railway Station in the second zone. And in Croydon, we have Croydon Railway Station to Moorbark Railway Station. Um, the ideology behind a curved hub model is to allow residents access to uh, major transport hubs. So all of the hubs chosen, with the exception of the shopping precinct in Lillardale are major transport hubs. Um, the Lilydale Shopping Precinct was implemented as a second hub in that, in that immediate vicinity to honour existing travel patterns via the fixed route of the 676 service. And it's actually proven to be the more popular uh, hub. Uh, we, we are finding that we have uh, three, times as more, uh, three times as many passengers going to the shopping precinct as going to the railway station. Uh, next slide, please. So how does it work? Um, as touched on, the, there are eight routes that have been replaced across the two zones, uh, the Tallybus uh, services as well as the 676, which was also known as the Little Dale Loop. Um, passengers would use the service by uh, either bringing up our call centre and speaking to an operations supervisor or by using the mobile phone application. We have asked 
uh, we have trained our operations supervisors and our drivers to help customers uh, transition to the mobile phone application because it gives them better visibility over how um, how to book the service, where the bus is, and the details associated with the service. Whereas when booking via phone, there is an SMS that goes out to the person with a link, uh, but they don't necessarily have complete visibility over their, their travel and their travel plans. And that's quite important in the Lilydale zone as opposed to Roeville. Roeville, we saw the main demographic being uh, school children, um, so quite technologically savvy. In the Lilydale zone, we had a higher percentage of retirees and, and the upper age brackets, people who struggled to use or, or to have um, technology. We found a lot of, uh, a lot of the uh, passengers didn't necessarily have a smartphone, so that wasn't, wasn't a possibility. The next part of the service um, available to the residents is a home pickup. So those who have accessibility needs can, can contact us and, and organise a home pickup, whereas most people will be afforded a uh, walking distance less than 200 metres. In most cases, it's actually, I think, an average of 120 metres uh, to walk to a, either a virtual stop or an existing DOT uh, stop. Uh, the pickup times are flexible. I think Mover are currently working on a, a, a guaranteed pickup time as well, which which we'll be implementing in a in a third zone next year. Um, but in terms of hours of operation, we were able to increase the hour span of both um, the Roville Telebus areas and the, the Lilydale Telebus areas greater than what it was operating under a, under a fixed route service, so people had um, greater access to the services at different times of day. Uh, and as we spoke about the virtual stop to hub model, how that works is we do use existing uh, DOT bus stops in the zones, um, but existing stops don't always allow great access to residents. So move it, have uh, the ability to implement virtual stops uh, within the network. And as stated before, that allows uh, passengers access to a stop within 200 metres and, and in most cases the average of 120 metre walk to a, to a stop location. Uh, next slide, please. Fine. So the, the basis of the FlexiRide trial in Roeville and Lilydale is to provide a cost neutral service. How that works is we use the existing costing model of the uh, DOT contracts for those routes. And in the back end, in our, in our scheduling processes, we, we determine what the labour and vehicle cost would be to operate the DOT contracts as a fixed route service. And we use those inputs to uh, scale the vehicle and the labour um, aspects of the DRT service. So there's a very important part of Move It's service analysis, which one we'll get to later, where we look at um, uh, customer travel patterns. Uh, this is a little bit uh, different from fixed route services. Fixed route service, we, we base our um, uh, service headway, so the uh, frequency of services throughout the day. We usually have a consistent half hour, one hour, and then we wrap it up during peaks. Whereas what we do under DRT is we scale the amount of vehicles available at a certain time of day to match the customer demand. Now, if we don't scale those vehicles, we can find that uh, we may not be able to run a cost neutral service. So really important to rely upon move its uh, service analysis data in that, in that way. Uh, increased service zones. So we saw through the, the maps on the first slide that the service zone uh, is much, much larger than, than what would be traditional for someone to walk to the fixed route. Um, so it gives greater access to people, more convenient. Um, so there, there, are, there is a slide later on where we have some actual customer feedback on there that, that uh, compares it with an Uber service. It's not an Uber service um, because we focus on aggregation of passengers rather than single person, single vehicle. But it does add a lot more convenience over what a fixed route service would traditionally be. Uh, increased patronage. So we're, we're happy to report that even during COVID, in, I think it was March, we hit our peak uh, number of passengers on the Roval services. So traditionally, the Telebus uh, would only take an average of 50 passengers per day. In March, on the Flexi Ride on Demand, uh, we were taking over 200 people per day, so four times the patronage. And even now, during some of the harshest lockdown conditions, we're still taking in excess of 80 to 90 passengers per day. So it's been a, a 
a great success from that point of view, trying to get people on public transport and, and leaving their cars at home. Uh, the decreased wait time is an average of 6.7 minutes. One, if you could flip to the next slide. We did have a, um, a target of no longer than 30 minute wait time to, to match the, the headway of the fixed route service. As you can see from the graph below, even during in March where we peaked, uh, when restrictions were eased, um, it was less than 10 minutes. And, and since then, it, it's remained quite consistent around the, the eight minute mark. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just to, to speak a bit about the passenger and driver experience, as you can see there, some quotes from uh, passengers about the uh, convenience or, or the, uh, the level of service being quick, quick to, to pick them up. Uh, it, the app does have the ability to leave uh, feedback and a, and a driver rating. And, and what we can see here, this is from a combined Roville and Lillardale service area. It's 95% of passengers are rating their drivers as a, as a five-star, which is great to see. Um, we may talk a little bit later. I think Melissa has some questions for us around the, the driver experience. Um, so I might, I might leave that for the, for the question later and, and continue on the slides. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Hayden. So uh, we've spoken a lot about the experience so far in vehicle with the project, uh, you know, the services that were converted into on demand and what the general kind of sentiment's been from the market. What I wanted to do now, and I think it's more relevant for this audience, is to have a look at like where this could work well in your local area and, and maybe where to start thinking about demand responsive transport and where you could start, of course, you know, uh, supporting these kind of projects. Um, in your local area. So this is actually a slide that was created by the Department of Transport and a presentation that we shared recently where, you know, I love this concept, as you can see on the left-hand side, where they mentioned the, the Goldilocks zone, the Just Right zone. And as you can see here, this is actually a stacked bar chart and the colors in the bottom are showing you the different types of uh, services that, that are being run and the the uh, the axes on the left is showing you uh, the, the the number of patrons that they're moving, so to speak, or boardings per hour. And look on the lower side, you're you're pushing air. You know, there's poor productivity. It's net negative economic and social value. Uh, the, these are kind of routes that are low patronage, are being very uh, uh, poorly utilized. But they're also kind of difficult sometimes to remove because you don't want constituents or or people complaining, creating ministerials or other types of issues. So. These are legacy, a lot of the times, legacy routes that may be there or just really necessary routes that can't be moved. Um, on the flip side, of course, we know the overcrowding. Uh, on the right-hand side, the overcrowding, unrealized patronage growth issues. And look, DRT doesn't necessarily work perfectly everywhere because it can be a very expensive project. So you really want to meet this kind of middle ground where your patronage isn't extortionately you know, large or high um, per hour. And, and you have that ability there to get closer to people, to get them uh, picked up at a virtual stop, as Hayden mentioned earlier, that may just be a few hundred meters away from your home and uh, therefore increasing uh, you know, patronage and convenience from there. But there is a, a big, you know, there's a very large element uh, to planning that particular service area. And you, know, you could have a very large LGA um, a local government area that you just want to really target this on-demand uh, service area in a much smaller part of that. So, you know, how do you do that? And, and Hayden mentioned earlier this curb to hub model where you're picking up people close to home, but you're forcing attraction and, and, gener and, and the aggregation through limiting the destinations that people can go to. And that may be a backbone high frequency rail service, as I've seen one of the questions is asking, or that may also be um, a, uh, a, a shopping center is something that attracts uh, quite a lot of movement from there as well. So there is an element of, you know, looking at the data. So we have millions of users actually move. It has millions of users in Melbourne, and we can see where people plan to go um, throughout their day. And, uh, and we can generate effectively like simulations on if this were an on-demand area and the same level of journey planning took place, what would the quality of that service look like? Where would you draw the boundaries to make sure you're capturing all the right uh, locations to you know, increase the possibilities of people uh, utilizing that particular service? So there is a very strong analysis process that happens. So once you have an inkling you want to do this in your LGA, there is a strong planning process and conversations that need to take place to pick the right location, simulate it so you understand the right level of vehicles you need, as Hayda mentioned, to run at a very cost-efficient but yet effective kind of service. And the last thing, um, just because we're running out of time here, is uh, just a gentle reminder that it is a dynamic service. It literally changes day to day, day to day, week to week. 
uh, season to season. So it's really important that you have the right data on the service as it continues on to listen to your customers. And as Hayden mentioned, you know, how's the feedback looking? What's the actual feedback we're getting? How many repeat riders are we getting on a daily slash weekly basis? And, you know, what does pick up and drop offs per hour look like across these different tractor zones? So, you know, just a, a bit of thinking there to leave you with is that it is a very dynamic process. Um, it, it, you know, from literally from planning to day-to-day -day services to continuous improvement and picking the right partners, you know, like Ventura as an operator or like Move It as a tech partner is really important because it is very much a matrimony, um, you know, through the life of that service as it moves forward. So thank you uh, very much for your time. We're excited to, to answer questions. Um, please, if you have anything you'd like for us to, to answer, let us know. Thank you. Thank you, Juan and Hayden. That was a fantastic presentation, very exciting, um, and you're doing wonderful things in terms of innovating bus services and looking for ways to be responsive as well. Um, just a reminder to all to post your questions in the Q&A, and we'll check in with Jane shortly, but um, as Hayden mentioned, I do have a, a question that I was keen to ask about um, the driver experience. So we heard about the customer experience, um, keen to know more about the driver experience, and I guess how that may then flow onto the customer experience as well with regard to these types of services. Yeah, definitely. Thank, thank you, Melissa. So in terms of the driver experience, it, it's really, really important to have the right driver. So through the different services that, that we provide as, as a, a very um, broad, broad operator, we do have different people suited to different roles. So when we talk about someone who's working on an on-demand service, um, something that, that has really close contact with, with customers, you need someone who, who has a high level of customer service, someone who's quite engaging with the public and able to not only um, have um, great professional conversations with them, but someone who's also able to, to drive the, um, the change in service, someone who's able to work with and, and particularly through the, the, the initial trial stages, someone who's able to work with the, the business to give feedback on what the customers are wanting, uh, what the, how the service is operating, just to help us make those little tweaks in the, the programming or the setup of the service to, um, to make it um, uh, a success through the trial. Uh, the other part of it is, um, I guess, what, what the driver feels. And I, I think with the DRT services and particularly through the Rayville zone, we spend a lot of time or we have spent a lot of time on the road with the drivers, um, speaking to them, so how's the service going? What, what are you seeing from it? How, how are your interactions with the customers? And one of the things that we find is, is just the, the overall increased job satisfaction from them. Uh, I think I got talking to a driver for about 25 minutes the other day and, and he <laughs> was telling me about, I guess, the appreciation that he has for the, the engagement that he has with the community now. Not only that, we the Move It application allows us to get um, more direct feedback to the driver. Now, some of you who, who are involved with public transport, unfortunately, we receive uh, one compliment for every 50 complaints. So it's a very negative sort of um, atmosphere for customer feedback. Whereas with DRT, we're seeing, uh, like you saw, 95% of feedback is a five-star review of the driver and, the, and, and comments as well saying, I uh, love the service very quick, the driver was, was helpful. So it's very positive in, in that way as well. Fantastic. Thank you, Hayden. Um, Jane, over to you. Any questions? Uh, from the yes. Floor? Yes. Thank you very much, Mel. Um, thank you, everyone, for sending your questions in. Keep sending them in. I'm going to focus on people who haven't asked a question yet, and then I'll get to those who've already had a question, but your questions will be in the list and we'll we'll deal with them. Uh, uh, we'll send them to the presenters um, if they don't get answered today. So first question is from Thomas Hardy Cogden from City of Manningham. How do, you, how do virtual stops work in terms of safety? E.g. currently public buses aren't allowed to stop except at formal stops due to potential pedestrian trip hazards. You may answer that one. Um, so we, we do perform risk assessments on the virtual stops. So Move It uh, are great in giving us a specific lap and long uh, GPS coordinate and we'll go out onto the road uh, and, and do a formal risk assessment to ensure it is safe. If a stop isn't safe, if there is something like a trip hazard or, a, or an overhanging tree, uh, then, then we'll look for a, a more suitable location to put it. 
Thank you. Um, our next question is from Claire Davy from Mornington Peninsula Shire Council. Is there an option of linking DRT with school contracts? At some schools on the peninsula, I understand school buses normally sit at the school between the morning and afternoon shifts. Could these buses be used to help with the trials in the service? Um, I might give a quick answer and hand over to Juan. Uh, I think there's a, a bit of sensitivity around uh, multi purpose of what, what the intention of the run is meant to be. Uh, we are using the Roeville service as a, uh, although not, not formally, we, we are encouraging the schools in the area to use it as a sort of last mile option for their students. So they may go to Stud Park as a hub and then use the, the flexi ride to, to head home from there. Yeah. And I think conceptually, there's a, a strong push I see happening in the market, in the local market around human-centered transport. The idea that, you know, currently we have all these silos of contracts, public transit, you know, paratransit, um, community transport, school, et cetera. But a seat is a seat. And if we can find a way to intelligently and automatically manage rules around these different, you know, groups, the sensitivities around different groups, et cetera, imagine the efficiencies we'd have from a government perspective in running those contracts collectively where possible. So technologically, you know, from the technology perspective, we're very, you know, happy and, and welcoming that, that principle. But as you can imagine, you know, commercially and in, and in practice, there's a few more uh, mental and kind of uh, other hurdles we have to get through to get there. So it's a great idea and, and we hope that it happens sooner than later. This next question kind of comes on to your actual bus vehicle infrastructure. What do you need? Um, Annette Crohn from RMIT has asked, um, are the buses mini buses or normal size buses? Uh, they, they are, so our preferred vehicle of choice, we were trialling a, a Hino Poncho, which is a 24-seater. It would be uh, not quite a mini, but, but not quite a midi. Uh, but we also do use midi buses, which are old Dennis Darts, um, which are, uh, some of them have been replaced also with Optair uh, solos, I think they're called. So a mixture of different buses. But in terms of uh, using an ultra low, a, a, like the bus behind Jane there, um, probably not, not suitable in that size, but MIDI is definitely suitable for a DRT service. And, and Hayden, I'll compliment that in saying that we have tried collectively to find a good uh, low floor mini or midi bus that's electric, mm -hmm. but the market isn't there yet, right? It's such a fresh market in Australia and our, you know, our kind of manufacturers are catching up. So, uh, keep, you know, keep an eye on that space. Uh, you'll hopefully hear some uh, low floor minis coming soon that are electric. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, so our next question um, is from Vincent Ong at the uh, city of Casey. Um, very interested in can you provide some high level costing comparisons for DRT service, how it compares to other services, for example, a community bus that council might also be running? Um, have you got any metrics that you advise councils could use um, to estimate the cost per service kilometre? Um, or maybe there are some public, publicly available business case studies that you can point us in the direction of. The FlexiRide service is quite young in that sense. I, I think there's a, a bit more discussion needed around costing models. What we have been able to implement from more of an operational perspective is uh, basing it on equal ordinary hours, so uh, labour and kilometre costs. Um, when it comes to costing labour and kilometres, there's always a level of um, what we refer to as debt uh, aspects of it, so in-service and debt. Um, but it's best to, if you've got an example, I'm happy to, to have a chat after this, if you've got an example of community bus service that you'd like to, to transition to DRT, we, we could um, try and apply that costing model to, to that to see how it stacks up. That's great. Thank you. Um, also a question from Vincent um, from Casey. How do you manage the challenge of people not showing up for their bookings or who are late for their bookings? Uh, great question. Um, we actually do monitor what no-show orders. Um, because everyone who uses the service is required to register, so they put their name, their email, their, their phone number in, we, we don't see too many people who are no-shows or, or, um, or late to, to the zones. Um, what we do, because we do have a dedicated uh, operational centre to this, if someone isn't present at the stop, we'll usually give them a phone call and see what's happening. Sometimes we will find they went to a different location than what was, what was booked, and then we're able to reroute the bus to, to their location and pick them up. 
Excellent. Um, next question is from uh, Tiffany Ladovsky at the City of Wyndham. How does the DTR comply with DDA standards for public transport or is this model not mandated for your service? Okay, um, the buses that we use are DDA compliant. Um, the, the, the level of difficulty is with the virtual stop model. So using existing DOT stops, they are DDA compliant. Um, virtual stops, I believe there's a, the DDA compliance, um, there's not a direct relation to the virtual stops. One might be able to speak to it further. There, there is not a direct relation. We, we do offer, and that was uh, what Hayden mentioned earlier, that if there is uh, somebody that needs you know, a, a bit more assistance to get onto the vehicle, we do offer the ability to, um, for that person to be picked up from home, so directly, uh, which in some ways you know, kind of avoids any issues with a virtual stop now being DDA compliant. But within, you know, let's say Roeville, there's literally hundreds of these virtual stops that are peppered around. And it would be, as you can imagine, you know, very impossible, complicated and costly to try to DDA certify or convert all of these kind of, you know, literally well, well, uh, well tuned uh, kind of curbsides, et cetera, to pick up vehicles. So we offer that kind of alternative pickup method. For anybody that does need that DDA level support, and then of course existing bus stop infrastructure, which they would have already um, interacted with before uh, the DRT service started, is still available to them to be picked up from as well. Excellent, thank you. Um, just watching time, we may come to one of your questions, Mel, if you want to just have a think about what you might next ask. Um, Susan Bissinger from, uh, I think you're from uh, Mornington Peninsula, Susan, asks, what would be the approximate payback period on an electric bus? And would this prohibit transition to a better energy source when it becomes available, for example, hydrogen? That in the sense of DRT or is... Um... Uh, I think it's probably looking at the overall um, cost <laughs> issues, um, Hayden, but it's one we can take on notice and share with some of our other speakers, if you like, as well. I think I think that's actually a really good question for Ian, actually. I, I think yeah. he's done a lot of research on that. Okie doke. Um, Mel, I'm going to toss to you now um, your question, please. Thank you, John. Thank you. Um, one and Hayden, um, the patronage, no, patronage so I was saying, patronage numbers during COVID lockdowns and restrictions are really worth noting um, and shows that there is um, great resilience in this style of service. Is there anything further you could share on the um, critical success factors? Yeah, definitely. I think it's it's all to do with the design of this service. Um, the, the curb to hub model is designed around getting people to uh, areas for essential, essential reasons for travel. So the getting to shopping centres to do shopping, getting to transport hubs to, to head to other destinations, whether that be uh, commuting to work or, or heading to a, a medical appointment. Um, I think we've seen resilience across the entire bus network, as Naomi spoke to, to earlier for, for that primary reason. Um, but if we look at the Roville model in particular, Roville has struggled for, for a number of years to be um, widely connected in, in transport at all. And the DRT service has implemented a, a level of convenience and a level of access to those who have previously been um, um, disadvantaged in that, in that zone. I would say marketing as well as the, the other thing that I would add to that. So, you know, as whenever you're changing human behavior, that people have been doing the same thing, you know, getting onto this bus for 20 odd years, you know, a decade, uh, you need to market, you need to, you know, get to the right locations, have the right messages, um, you know, really in, in try to enable people to, you know, to spread word of mouth and, and get people excited about the service. And that's been a, a huge boon in, in getting that uptake to happen so quickly is a lot of that was word of mouth and, and literally like flyer drops or letter drops, so to speak, at different locations to, to raise awareness on that. Fantastic. And I'm sure... Um... Lots of the attendees today have watched your presentation thinking, I'd love to have this style of service in our city. Um, you did share some insights. I wonder if there's anything else you could share in terms of, I guess, what councils could do to help you know, bring these sorts of trials to their cities as well and yeah, bring these benefits. I have an opinion, Hayden, and I'm sure you have one too. <laughs> uh, happy for you to go first in this one. Okay, okay no problem. So... Um, ultimately, uh, the many of these projects that we've spoken about are, are transitioning or converting, 
existing, you know, route services, existing contracts into DRT. So that basically means that the ultimate blessing needs to come from the Department of Transport. So, you know, what I would highly, um, you know, what I would advise in, in a friendly way is to, you know, you know, your local government areas, you know, uh, where there's pain points or neighborhoods that are growing quickly that lack public transport service. Um, or, or kind of routes that you get complaints about because maybe they're not as patronage as you would like for them to be. Um, I think those are a great opportunity to just raise your hand with, um, you know, the network planning team at the Department of Transport or the innovation team and say, guys, we're, you know, we're keen to be a part of the trials. We, you know, we've heard of, you know, some of the local successes, some of the local benefits, and, and we'd be willing to, to take the dive, you know, to take the, uh, the step with you. And I think just starting there and acknowledging that is a big first step to get these things moving. And just adding to that as well, I think we're going to hear from Mornington Peninsula Council later today as well. Mornington Peninsula Council have been a really big advocate for improving the services in their area. I think the relationship that the council has with the local operator, whether it be Ventura, Transdev, CDC, whoever, it's really important that the network planning staff from, from both organisations have these discussions about how they could better implement services as well. So. Okay, I've got a couple more questions in my, my chat list that I will go to, and then we're nearly at time, everyone. So um, our anonymous attendee has asked, is the attractiveness of demand responsive PT dependent on high frequency trunk corridors, e.g. trains every 10 minutes or less? Hayden? Yep, yeah, definitely is. So there is a need, uh, you, you cannot uh, completely change your, your network just to demand responsive. It is really important to have those demand responsive services feeding into a, a, a trunk route or a, uh, or a train service. And I think to complement that, you know, there are use cases, as I mentioned before, like brownfield, um, kind of public transport networks where maybe it's just too expensive, too costly to put in a fixed route. You can have a smaller, more dynamic service to you know, get people into the right public transport mindset before uh, other, other kind of uh, fixed route services are introduced. So, you know, yes, for the most part, but there's also other use cases where um, it's a good complement or a good alternative option before there's enough scale there to, to stand up a more fixed route service. And we'd love to see, a, just from, from Ventura's perspective, we'd love to see a regional township uh, converted into DRT. That would be a, a really good uh, use case for the program. We're getting some interest from uh, Wodonga, um, framed more as an interest than a question, so I'm not going to ask it, but Wodonga want to talk to you. Um, last question that I'll put to you, uh, I'm thinking, is from Yale Wong, and he's um, asking, the Roval Flexi Ride competes with the Route 681, 682, which serves largely the same coverage function. What has been the impacts on the fixed route patronage and also on the success of the DRT? In general, how can we ensure DRT is implemented on a reformed fixed route network? Quite a lot on that one. So over to you, gentlemen. Good question. Um, we've actually seen the DRT complement 681, 682, uh, believe it or not. Um, there, there are two uh, very different uh, passenger types. And, and I think we find with the passengers who remained on 681, 682, the um, passengers who um, enjoy the... Um, I guess the, the lack of change, those ones who are, who are a bit uncomfortable with, with trying something different. And as I said, the main demographic catching the FlexiRide DRT services are, are school children, uh, are younger, younger age groups, people who are wanting to try something different. So the two services complement each other in, in, in appealing to the different demographics. In the, so. All right. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Mel, I'll hand back to you to wrap up the session. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. A big, big thank you to um, Juan and Hayden for joining us today. A really wonderful presentation. Um, we look forward to staying connected with you and we're really excited to um, see what the future brings and um, more of these um, great innovations and trials. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank, thank you. you very much for having thank us. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Take care. See you.